Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful week. Um, I first off want to remind you that there's still a few days left to enroll in the Training Scale Masterclass. You have until Saturday night to sign up for the Masterclass. We've already had a ton of people sign up and already started going through the materials. So if you've already signed up for the masterclass, that is awesome. Tonight, I have a few questions. I have a lot of um, notes to take. These are my notes to go over for tonight's lecture. Um, we didn't have too many questions. So if you guys have questions, feel free to put them there in the chat. Hi, Amy. It was so good to talk to you last night, Amy, about groundwork. Um, but tonight's theme, since we're launching the Train Scale Masterclass, again, is I'm going to be talking about the dressage training scale. Um, as you know, last Sunday, we had our webinar on the dressage training scale. And it was so awesome because there were like 270 people plus that showed up live to talk about the training scale. And I'm so grateful to have this community and to see so many of you guys dedicated to your training. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Jackie. Um, it's really amazing that that many people showed up on a Sunday on their free time to talk about the training scale and to learn about dressage. And that is just really, really exciting. And like I said, I'm so grateful for it. Uh, what else? So thinking about the training scale, and I've been like thinking about it all week as I've been teaching all of my students and riding all of my horses is how much it applies to every single situation. So some of you guys might know, or maybe you didn't know, but when I went to Europe a few months ago, I did get a young horse and he's a five-year-old. He got here a couple of weeks ago and like for a five-year-old, he's pretty advanced. Like he does a flying change and he does shoulder in and he does haunches in, like he does a lot. Um, but when I got him here, I realized that he has some holes in his basics. So what are the basics? The basics are the dressage training scale. So I needed to go back to suppleness was a big thing that he was missing. Like he... He's not a super tense or spooky horse, but physically he was kind of tense and he didn't really know how to let go through his body. And so I've been working with him a lot on getting suppleness. Like even though he does a flying change, even though he does half passes, I need to go back and work on that suppleness. And so I've been doing a lot of groundwork with him. Um, like we talked about in the academy last night with Amy the importance of groundwork and teaching your horse to give through their body and give in their neck and give in their pole and bend and release their hindquarters. The horse I just got from Europe, his name's Luigi, by the way, but he didn't have any of that. And, and I think that that's where people make mistakes in their training is that they think like, oh, my horse is supple. I've done first level. And then they never go back and they never work on those basics. So it's really important that even though your horse can collect, you always need to think about the bottom of the training scale. You always need to remember the base of the training scale. And most of your ride is focused on rhythm, suppleness, and connection. Let me see who's here. Okay. Hi, Kathleen and Amanda. We have Sasha here. Oh, no, you broke your back. Hoping to be back in the saddle soon. Wow, that is... Scary. I hope you're okay, Sasha. Hi, Shari and Amy. Good to see all of you guys here. So back to the training scale. Um, that is why the training scale is so important. I was also working with one of my students this week and we were working on the pirouette canner. And um, I told her, I said, what happened to your training scale? Like your training scale just totally fell apart. Uh, because this happens to all of us. When we start working on collection or pirouettes or something that's hard, it's so easy to lose the base of the training scale. So the rhythm, the suppleness, and the connection very easily fall apart when you are doing the more difficult movements. And that's why it's so important that you understand the training scale and that you always have it there in the back of your mind. So last Thursday, 
I asked you guys to rate like from one to 10, how often you think about the training scale when you're riding and when you're teaching. So let me know if you're live here in the chat. Have you been thinking more about the dressage training scale this week? And has it changed your riding and your approach when you're riding this week? Because I know that I have since we had the webinar on Sunday and since I'm welcoming in a bunch of new students into the training scale masterclass, I've been thinking about it so much more. Okay, Kim says yes. Kath Kathleen says 10. <laughs> um, who else is here? Oops, sorry. Yeah, so it's so important that you always have the training scale in the back of your mind when you're riding, when you're teaching, whatever you're doing, you have to keep that in mind. I was also thinking a lot about where I learned the training scale and where I learned all of this theory. And to be honest, I learned it a lot from Christine Traurig. And I went back and I was like watching some videos from a long time ago of her training me with Harvey. And it's amazing. Christine has this amazing ability when she's teaching that she uses all of this vocabulary from the training scale. Like she's always talking about suppleness throughness, connection, impulsion, all of those things she's really mixing in to her lessons. And that's why it's so valuable to know this stuff because not all trainers have that ability to mix in like theory with what they should be doing in their lesson. So if you guys have already signed up for the masterclass, that's so awesome. I'm so excited to take another group of students through each level of the dressage training scale, although you're never done with it. That is for sure. You're never done with it. Um, I got a super nice note from Karen who just signed up for the masterclass. And she said, thanks. I watched my mare's mane today and it was amazing what it made me feel. Also helped me to, to help her with her rhythm. So she's talking about in the canner when the mane is flying up. And Karen said, I've been riding almost 60 years and a light bulb came on. The masterclass paid for itself today. So that's so awesome. And I love to hear these little success stories from you guys just about how much the videos or the Facebook lives or whatever, how much they help you guys. That makes it all worth the while for me. And um, so, yeah, that's awesome, Karen. And what else? Oh. I wanted to talk also about um, Catherine Dufour. So Catherine Dufour is one of my all-time favorite riders to watch. And I've been watching her. She was at the European Championship. She was at the Olympics. I've been watching her a lot. I also follow her on Instagram. And she, she said that she really only does two days a week that are super high-intensity training with her horses. So two days a week, she's working her pirouettes, her half passes, her piaf visage. So what do you think that she is working on all those other days of the week? Like what does Catherine Dufour work on the other six days of the week? And I guarantee you that it's the base of the dressage training scale. So she's working rhythm, suppleness, and connection. That's so important. You cannot keep your horse in collection every moment that you're on them. And that's what a lot of people do is that they, they think, Oh, now I know collection and all they ever do is collected canner or collected trot. And this is where a lot of horses and people go wrong is that they forget the base of the training scale and then they start having behavioral issues. So the horse starts, rearing or bucking or running sideways because they've forgotten their basics. Or the other thing is they start having like mental issues, like the horse starts getting frustrated or angry or upset or physical issues. So the training scale is really more than dressage. It's, it's about how to have a good relationship with your horse. It's about how to have a positive relationship with your horse where you have structure, where you have boundaries, where you have a routine 
that you go through with your horse and the routine gives you and your horse both confidence. And that's really the beauty of the training scale. That's what I hope to give all of you guys um, that are taking the training scale masterclass is kind of that structure. And we go a lot. We go into groundwork exercises. Um, all of that stuff is super. So for those of you guys that um, haven't signed up yet or that you have signed up, we're going to do an orientation call this Sunday at 1030 a.m. just to kind of like meet and greet everyone. We have, we gave away 40 already, but um, Joellen, she's our director of happiness. She told me we have 10 more water bottles. So come to the orientation on Sunday and I'm going to give away 10 more of these. If you've already taken the course, you can come and maybe you'll get lucky and win a water bottle. These have been in such high demand and they are super cool. So you can put cold or hot or whatever in there. Okay, so... I have a couple of questions tonight about the training scale, not too many. So one is from, her name is Catherine, I think. How do you balance rhythm and suppleness? So she said that when she gets her pony to be really supple and loose, that the rhythm starts, she starts to lose the rhythm, like the, the rhythm and the tempo start to get all over the place. So my, my first thought with this is that you need to then, like once you get your horse supple, you need to move on to connection because connection is what allows you to then control the new suppleness that you have, right? Because once your horse is like moving around and they're supple and they're loose and the mental side of suppleness, once they're in a good frame of mind, then you have to start guiding that. So you guide that with your seat and your reins. That's the connection piece. So I would say that, great, your horse is supple. Now start thinking about the connection. The connection isn't just about your reins. Connection is about your seat and your legs. Connection is about getting that circle of energy from the hind leg through the back and to the mouth, where you're really controlling your horse's energy with your seat, your leg, and your weight. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, we had another question on YouTube from Wayne. He says, my five-year-old gets behind the bit and loses his forward impulsion at the trot. More leg doesn't really solve the problem. Any suggestions? This is another great question that can be solved by the dressage training scale. And what I hope to show you is that like pretty much all of your training issues are solved by the dressage training scale. So in this situation with a horse that curls behind the bit, they're losing connection. Like horses that curl behind the bit, they've lost connection. If you don't have connection, you can't have impulsion, right? Because if you look at the, my water bottle here, impulsion is above connection. Connection has to do with acceptance of the bit. So your horse has to take contact. Like you don't want them super braced in the hand, but if they're hiding behind the bit, then there's no way that you can get them to have impulsion because you can't get the hind in to engage until they're accepting the bit. So what are some exercises that you can do to a horse that curls? Um, is always a little bit inside leg to outside rein. So a little shoulder four, a little leg yield, anything where you're basically artificially connecting the inside hind leg to the outside rein so that at least you get contact on the outside rein and that helps to get your horse taking the bit. Okay, let's see the comments here. Susan says, my enthusiasm and knowledge are an inspiration. <laughs> Good, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, let's see. Donna says, I feel like my horse is drunk sometimes until I control his body. Yes, for sure. Um, connection is my biggest issue right now. Who else is having an issue with connection? I think that connection is for sure one of the most difficult aspects of dressage. I know it's something that I really have a hard time with. I think it's really hard when your horse is uneven in the connection, like when they're really strong on one rein and empty in the other rein, or when they like don't listen to one leg as well as the other. 
Let's see. Um, Kathleen says me and Lori says me. <laughs> okay. We all have connection issues. So at least that's good. We can all be honest with each other <laughs> about our connection issues. What else? Okay. I have another, there was another post from Linda on the dressage club. And Linda is like, she's one of my biggest fans and she's always so supportive on the club of everyone and so helpful and on all of the calls. So if you're here, Linda, shout out to you because you're amazing. But Linda posted this comment about um, basically how she's been riding more. She's bumped it up from four rides a week to six rides a week. And she says, my riding overall is worse. We have moments of self-carriage and such, but so behind my leg and sluggish. Also not listening to my leg unless I have a whip. I'm grateful for him and our health, but it's like I've gone backwards. Should I back off? I still plan to come each day to check him and clean his hooves, etc. But could we benefit from my not getting on him six times a week? I'm embarrassed by this. I'm embarrassed in lessons and considering pulling out of one tomorrow. Thanks for listening and any input. So I really appreciate um, Linda for putting herself out there because I think that we all feel that way sometimes in dressage. It's really hard and it does feel like the harder you work, the worse it gets. <laughs> like I felt that way. Like I, you get all motivated and you like watch a video or you watch the Olympics and you're like, okay, like I'm going to do this. Like I'm going to ride every single day and work super, super hard. And then it gets worse and it's really frustrating and it's super hard and you're not sure why or what mistake or what's happening. So a couple of things that I want to talk about. One is that I think dressage is a little bit like, okay, my math days are so bad, but you know, like the graph that at first it goes up really fast at once, and then it kind of reaches a limit. That's kind of what dressage is like here. I'm going to draw a graph for you guys. Okay. This is the graph that I mean. Maybe someone can tell me, do we have any mathematicians that can tell me what kind of graph that is? Okay. So, but basically that's kind of what dressage is like. Here, I'll show it again. It's kind of like at first, like when you're first starting out dressage or when, yeah, okay, plateau, but there's some other fancy name for this. I am a biologist, I should know. But at the beginning, there's like this phase where you're able to get fast a lot quickly. And then at the top here, the plateau is basically the limit. Like there is a limit to your horse's physical capabilities. Um, it could be a parabola. Um, yeah, Sasha, you might be right. But anyways, so there's a limit to what your horse physically can do. Not every horse can be a Grand Prix horse. And so I think that it's important to kind of recognize what your horse's limit is and to be okay with that. And that's not to say that, you know, you can't keep learning and can't keep trying things, but, but you also need to kind of know that there is that reverse curve where like you're going to make a lot of progress and then you're going to reach a little bit of a plateau and that's okay. The other thing that I want to say is that sometimes in that plateau, sometimes when you're actually getting worse or not making any progress is where you're actually learning the most. So sometimes in that struggle where you feel like you're getting worse or you're trying really hard or you're trying new things, that's actually what happens right before you have a big breakthrough and you get up to the next level. So it's important to recognize that as well. Now, that said, I'm a little bit, I think a lot of us are very type A, very hardworking. And so we think that the more, more is better, right? But that's not necessarily the thing. And I think that it is really important to give your horses full days off where you just leave them alone. You don't get on their back. You don't ask anything of them. Those rest days are really important. And I remember when I was, um, first like really training dressage 
here in California with Sue Martin. And she was so strict about two days off. Like she wouldn't let me ride my horse. And I was always like, I was so bored. I only had one horse. I really wanted to ride him. And it was just like, no, like Thursdays and Sundays, the horses are off. You don't ride them because physically what we ask of them is very demanding. And so they do need those days off. Um, and like I was talking about before with Catherine Dufour, I was surprised. She said she only does two days a week, high intensity training. The rest of the time she's focusing on basics. She's taking her horse out in the field. I mean, she's obviously riding more than twice a week, but we cannot expect our horses to perform at like full level every day of the week. So that's my spiel on that. Hopefully that inspired some of you guys. Thank you for sharing, Linda, because we definitely have all been there. Um, what else? Do any of you guys have questions? I think there's one here. Um, Lauren says, my horse is connected in the trot, but evades the contact, puts his head up and gets strong and heavy in the canter. Transition, any tips? Um, so in this situation, I would recommend doing a lot of like trot can or trot transitions. So like get the contact and the connection how you want it to be nice at the trot. Then go to the canter. If your horse starts to get too strong, then go back to the trot again um, until you can just kind of connect those dots. Uh, sometimes this happens because the canter is like a really powerful gate for some horses. Like they have a lot of power behind and they don't really know how to balance themselves. So lots of transitions. Uh, the snowman is also a great exercise. If you don't know what the snowman is, search my YouTube channel because I have a video on it. Let's see. Sam is from here from South Korea. Hi, Sam. That's so cool that you're from South Korea. So um, what else? Yeah. So you guys, we have until Saturday if you want to join the Training Scale Masterclass. This course, I only do it twice a year, so it won't be available again until 2022, which I like can't believe that it is already going to be 2022. So if you want to get into the Training Scale Masterclass, you should do it before Saturday because it's awesome. On Sunday, we are going to be having an orientation call for the new students. So if you're already enrolled, I hope to see you on Sunday. It's optional. Um what else? Oh, I wanted to read one more comment from Barb. So Barb said, having had many instructors in my riding endeavor, I can say without a doubt that none were able to explain the whys and hows and importance of the dressage training scale as Amelia. I was a firm believer that there was no need to learn anything about the training scale until I took Amelia's course. Only now, after the course completion, can I say this is why things go wrong and this is how to fix them. And this is important because it will keep my prized possession, my horse, happy and healthy. So that's a nice testimonial from Barb, who took the training scale masterclass. And um, it's a little bit complicated. Like once you learn the levels of the training scale, is then you think, okay, how do I actually apply this concept to my training? And in general, of course, you start with the bottom and you work your way to the top. Like that's in general how you should use the training scale. However, it's not like you need to master every level before you go to the top level. So for example, impulsion comes before straightness on the training scale. There are times that like, if your horse is super crooked, I mean, like if your horse is like going down the rail, like a crab with her butt way to the inside, that could be inhibiting impulsion. So there are times that maybe you need to get your horse straighter and that that is actually going to improve your impulsion. So definitely the training scale is a guide, but there's times that you kind of skip around in the training scale. Um, and then also, I think that sometimes when you go up to the top, like with a young horse, for example, or a green horse, I'll test out the collection. Like I'll just work some collected movements 
and I'll try to figure out what falls apart, like which piece of the training scale falls apart. Is it the connection? Is it the rhythm? Because when I see what part of the training scale falls apart, that tells me a lot about the horse. And it tells me a lot about what I need to help the horse with. So that's a lot about like what we talk about in the master classes. There's tons of exercises specifically for each level so that you know exactly, okay, what's a suppleness exercise that works for my horse? What's an impulsion exercise that works for my horse? And every horse is a little different. Like every horse has different strengths and different weaknesses. Every horse, certain exercises work better for some horses and riders than for others. So you need to take that into account. Like I do not train all of my horses the same way. They all have a little bit of a different recipe. However, I train all of my horses based on the dressage training scale, just like every other top rider. So all of the top riders that you guys see winning gold medals at the Olympics train their horses based on the dressage training scale. And I guarantee you that the majority of time that they spend riding their horse is focusing on the bottom of the training scale. That's why it's a pyramid, right? It's not a square. It's not a reverse pyramid. It's not a funnel, right? (laughs) It's not a funnel. It's a pyramid. And the pyramid shows you more or less the time distribution that you should spend on each level. So yes, you should spend some time at collection, but you shouldn't spend your entire ride collecting your horse. So that's why it's such a valuable tool is because It's this guide, but yet within the guide, as you learn dressage, as you train many, many hundreds of horses, which I have done, um, you kind of learn how to adapt the training scale, how to adapt the exercises, how to adapt your system to fit that horse's specific needs. So uh, let's see. Oh, hi, Cheryl. You caught me live tonight. Uh, let's see who else. Cheryl here has a question. She says that her horse likes to evade the connection when she's in heat. She's much harder to keep supple and will get bracy and lose connection. Um, yeah, so the when the mares go into heat, that is very common that your training scale kind of falls apart. For a couple of reasons. One is that hormonally, right? You're, when mares go in heat, it affects them mentally. And so they're thinking about other things besides working. It also affects them physically. So just like us, like they can get crampy, they can get a little painful when they're ovulating. So it has both a mental and a physical component if you ride a mare and if they're in heat. So When you know that your mare is in season, then even more so, you need to be thinking about the training scale and maybe all you work on is rhythm and suppleness. You know, you might need to back things down and just kind of know where your horse is that day and adapt. And I think that that's important too, is that until you have rhythm, suppleness, and connection, you can't really go on up the training scale. So there's days that maybe your mare is in heat, or maybe your horse is having a bad day, or maybe they've had a week off. Like all you get to work on then is the basics, the base of the training scale. And that's okay. You need to be okay with that. You need to accept that and not worry like, oh, well, I didn't do my collection today. I didn't do my flying changes today. Because If you skip the base of the training scale, then the top of it's not right. Like it's not really collection if you don't have rhythm, suppleness and connection. So that's why it's it's really important to just embrace it. Um, Let's see. Kim wants me to look at her question above. I don't see her question. I'll try to find your question later, Kim. Um, let's see. What time is the class on Sunday? Okay, so the orientation 
for the training scale masterclass is at 1030 a.m. So I'm really excited if you've signed up for the masterclass to get to meet you on Sunday and um, you can still sign up until you have until Saturday at 11.55 p.m. to enroll in the masterclass. And then for those of you guys that are part of the monthly workshops at noon, I'm going to be doing a lecture on throughness and top line development. So Sunday's a busy day. I'll be sitting here in front of my computer, but it's super fun. I am so grateful to all of you guys for being a part of this and also for all the feedback that you give me. So I really look to you guys for your suggestions, like what can I do better? What do you want to learn more about? Um, I'm always trying to improve my free videos, my free question seminars like this. Um, my husband is super excited. He actually just got a drone. So we're going to try to start doing some drone footage like from above videoing down into the arena, which I think is going to be really cool. However, I told him that I was concerned that he might hit me while I was riding my horse with the drone and he was very, very offended. So <laughs> I told him that he needs to practice before he's allowed to fly it around the horses. So hopefully I survived the drone experience, but I think it would be really cool um, for you guys to see from above, like the patterns that we do and what like, I don't know if we can get close enough, but to see the horse bend in their body, like on circles and half passes, I think that would be really cool. I also have a um, GoPro. So I'm going to try to put the GoPro on my helmet and see how that works for you guys. And yeah, this is fun. It's so good to hear from all of you guys. If you have any other suggestions, if you have video topics, if you have course ideas, uh, feel free to let me know. And hopefully I will see you in the masterclass or yeah, anything. Uh, let's see. Oh, Cheryl, let me see. I'll answer your question if I can see the end of it. She says she had a question about if I had a routine before entering the show ring before the whistle blows. Um, yeah, so like every... Of course, the training scale, but every horse is a little bit different. Um, some horses, I feel like when you go into the show ring, they need time to just kind of relax again. Like I'll even go posting trot and take them a little deeper and a little rounder and just focus on rhythm, suppleness, connection. Other horses, I kind of want to pump them up a little. Um, so I'll like go into the ring and maybe do some transitions like trot, halt, trot transitions. But it really depends on the horse, um, what my routine is going into the show ring. But I think when you're showing, when you're warming up is so important to remember your training scale, because that's what the judges are judging you on. Like when the judge sees your movement, whatever your movement is, whether it's a flying change, whether it's a shoulder in, whatever your movement is, the first thing they consider is the basics. And what are the basics? The basics are the dressage training scale. So when you're warming up your horse, when you're prepping for a show, it's really important to remember the training scale and to always keep that in the back of your mind. Um, let's see, Sasha. Yes, it will be interesting to see how the horses react to the drone. Usually they don't really care um, cause there was one flying around at my barn a few weeks ago. If it's far enough away, they don't really care too much. But like I said, I think if you accidentally ran the drone into the horse while you were riding, I think that could be really bad. So hopefully I don't like, hopefully I'm not risking my life just to get you guys some awesome video, but I would do that for you. <laughs> so I'll keep you posted and yeah, thank you all for joining me tonight. If you haven't yet and you're still on the fence, you should take the masterclass because it's an awesome course. Good night, everyone.